It's a big pleasure. I'm really, really excited to present you to James Holyfield. Uh, James is a professor in the Department of Political Science, and he's also the academic director of the Tower Center at Southern Methodist University, SMU in Dallas, Texas, as well as a member of the New York Council on Foreign Relations, and a Global Fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C. James also teaches courses in international and comparative politics and political economy with a specialization on Europe. That's why he's here and he's also studied in Paris and North America. He has worked as a consultant for different um, agencies of the U.S. government on migration as well as the United Nations, the World Bank, the OECD, the ILO, and other international organizations. You see, there's quite a long list, and I spare you the other organizations. <laughs> James is also the director of a number of research, very interesting research projects, including Magnet Societies, Immigration and Post-War Germany of the United States, and Migration, Trade, and Development. And he has a new book project, which is called Varieties of Migration States. And it is based on 40, 40 years of work around the globe. Um, and here James proposes a new interdisciplinary approach and research agenda. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk. And before I hand the floor over to you, James, I hand the floor over to my, to my colleague, Dr. Lorenz Wiese, who presents you the framework in which we uh, meet to, today, which is FFVT. <coughs> Lorenz is going to tell you what that's all about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, warm welcome from my side to the audience, both here in the room and in the Zoom room. Um, we hope that the technicalities would work. Um, yeah, as Petra mentioned, um, my name is Lorenz Wiese and I'm a project coordinator here at the Center for Human Rights Erlangen Nuremberg um, within the project FFPT, which is a joint collaborative uh, project, uh, a consortium of four institutes, um, the Center for Human Rights Erlangen Nuremberg, which we are based here, um, then in Osnabrück at the University, the IMES, the Institute for um, Migration and Intercultural Studies, as well as the Bonn International Center for Conflict Studies, and last but not least, the uh, GDI, the German Development Institute. And so uh, what is this project all about? It's FFVT, standing for um, Forced Migration and Refugee Studies, Networking and Knowledge Transfer. And this is what we do. We try to bring together scholars as well as practitioners working in the field of forced migration and forced migration studies, um, try to increase the uh, internationalization of the German research landscape in that area, as well as try to um, establish formats to engage with audiences outside of the academic area. So that means um, communicating research to a broader audience, uh, to non-academic stakeholders, be it the media, politicians um, or others. So this is kind of a brief overview of what we are uh, doing. Um, and this talk tonight is taking place in the framework of this project, which um, I should also mention is funded by the German Federal Ministry for Education and Research. And now with, uh, without further ado, I would like to thank you all again for joining uh, on this lovely sunny evening and hand over to Professor Holyfield. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm surprised to see <laughs> people here in such a beautiful, almost Mediterranean weather in, in Erlangen. Um, and I'm joining you from Paris, uh, where I'm spending a sabbatical year as a fellow of the French Institute for Advanced Study. So um, after the long COVID hiatus, I finally was able to come back to Europe. Uh, as many of you uh, know, uh, no traveling for a couple of years. So. But for me, it's really a, a bit of a homecoming, uh, having spent uh, many years in Paris and uh, quite a bit of time in Germany over these years. So uh, it's uh, now a pleasure to be back in Deutschland. Uh, uh, I was last year, I think in 2019. Um, uh, and I want to just say a special thank you to, to, to Petra Bendel and her colleagues for uh, for inviting me to come and speak to you here in Erlangen. And I have a special thanks for my uh, great friend and colleague, Hunger, 
who is a professor in, in Fulda. And he even brought a few, uh, an audience with him from Fulda, some of, some of the students who are here. So, but I'm sure there are quite a few of you who are joining online. And uh, I think in the interest of time, I will just plunge uh, straight into the subject and hopefully we can take some questions, especially maybe on the chat or q and I know uh, Lawrence probably will be monitoring that. So take, uh, take any questions you have and put them in the chat box or in the Q&A and we'll try to come back to them. So um, uh, Petra Bendel mentioned that I've been involved in quite a few uh, research projects uh, throughout my career, which spans almost 40 years, I'm happy to say. Um, and uh, I think it was in 1981-82 when I had my first research trip to Germany, which was in Nuremberg. And uh, uh, so I've been to Nuremberg and Erlangen quite a few times over the years. And as those of you who know my work, you know that I've also written extensively about German immigration policy and history. But the project I want to talk to you about today uh, is uh, called Understanding Global Migration, which is, of course, a very generic title. But this book is the result of a multi-year research project which involved colleagues from around the world. Um, and I will talk to you a little bit about the questions that we were addressing in this book, framework of the book, uh, and hopefully convince you to rush out to your local bookstore and, uh, or your local Amazon, perhaps, and, and order a copy of the book. Um, it's uh, recently published by Stanford University Press. And uh, this is a book that covers the globe. So uh, it, it's, it's really meant to be a reader uh, for students and scholars uh, who are interested in what's happening in not just in the global north, not just in Europe or North America, but especially uh, across the, the global, what is called often the global south. Um, it is, and again, I apologize for the shameless uh, publicity here, but this is a sister book. It's a sister volume for uh, another book that has been now going into its fourth edition. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this book. It is called Controlling Immigration. Uh, we slightly modified the, the subtitle of the book. It used to be a global perspective. Now we call it a comparative perspective uh, because it, um, uh, oops, I want to reset it. I hit the wrong button here somewhere. There we go. Uh, this book is uh, uh, has been used for many decades by students around the globe, uh, but it is really a comparative work, uh, and it is um, uh, focused very much on the OECD countries. So these are meant to be sister volumes, uh, companion volumes, and I hope you will have a chance to look at. So uh, a very long agenda for this talk. Uh, I will not be able to go through all of this, obviously, in one uh, session. Uh, but I do want to really focus, I think, on the, the second question, uh, which is what I call the theory of the history of the migration state. So our book, in Understanding Global Migration, is a look at migration states around the world. And I will give you a, a very clear definition of what we mean by migration state in just a moment. Uh, it's still a bit of a controversial concept. And in this book, we develop a, um, a new typology, uh, which is the title of my current research project called Varieties of Migration States. So we're trying to explain how migration governance works uh, in different parts of the world. So much of our work and research has been on. Uh, on the core sort of immigration countries, uh, which are covered in the controlling immigration book. This, this book, this project extends this now to look at uh, uh, different regions and different migration subsystems. I think probably one of the most innovative ideas to come out of this project is what uh, I have called migration interdependence. Uh, there may be some of you in the audience uh, who are students of international relations. So you will immediately recognize this, this idea of interdependence, uh, which is a, a very old concept. I will talk about it, but we have developed a measure of migration interdependence. And so I want to give you a little bit of the findings on this 
and get your reaction to this idea of migration interdependence and how it affects uh, political and economic development in various regions of the world. Uh, I probably will have to skip over the migration development section in the interest of time. And then I will have a few things to say at the end about, uh, about global migration governance, uh, about which I've been writing now for 30 years or more. Uh, so that's sort of the agenda for this talk. Uh, but I always, when I start a talk, especially for a fairly general audience, I know many of you have been studying migration, but I always want to start just to give you a sense of what the global migration trends are and try to raise some questions about what's going on uh, with respect to global migration. Uh, this uh, picture will look familiar to all of you, I suspect, um, <clears throat> which as a measure uh, using the United Nations data of the international migrant stock. And, um, you know, I always ask my students what, what strikes you about this, uh, about this graph, about this data. Uh, and uh, if you look, think about it for a second, you look at the numbers, uh, and I haven't updated these recently. I think we're up to about 280 uh, plus million uh, now, maybe 3.6% or so of the world's population. But these are people who have lived outside of their country of birth for one year or more. That's the official UN definition of a migrant. Um, but it's amazing how few people move. <laughs> so most people, migration still, I would argue, is the exception rather than the rule. Uh, my colleague and co-author, uh, the French demographer François Aron, quickly points out that if you take out the demographic giants from this, uh, namely China, India, uh, the United States, uh, Russia, uh, Nigeria, uh, if you take out the very large um, uh, populated countries uh, where the rates of migration or immigration are quite low, uh, the, the, the number goes up to roughly six and a half percent. So, so this is a little bit of a biased, uh, a biased number, but still most people in the world are not moving. So, you know, if you were a student of migration, you might want to start with a sort of counterintuitive question, why do so few people move? Um, you know, the, the, we, we've seen uh, not so much movement. Uh, this is just a quick graph to show you where the concentrations are. And it's always a little bit surprising, I think, for people to see that Europe uh, as a whole uh, has a very large migration population, followed very closely by Asia, uh, with North America coming in uh, sort of third in terms of the overall uh, population of migrants. Um, so why are people moving? Uh, why are the trends up? Uh, well, we can see that the global population has grown by about 60% in this period from 1985 to 2020, uh, but international migration has grown at a faster pace. So it's moved from 111 to today 281 million. So it's up 150%. So uh, international migration is increasing because of demographic and economic inequalities uh, between the richer and the poor nations, uh, also because of revolutions in communication, transportation, and I would add to this rights, uh, which have lowered the transaction costs for movement. Uh, but still, you know, step back for a second, you can see that Canada and the United States uh, to heavy immigration countries represent only 5% of the global population, uh, but they receive 20% of the global migrants. So, so Canada and the US are still the largest immigration countries. Um, this I think is also an important trend to focus on. Uh, we are, we, of course we have continued to see uh, an important uh, amount of South to North migration, which is represented by the green line here. Um, but you can see that the movements of people is increasing very rapidly in the south. So more movement south to south, still a good deal of movement north to north, uh, but not so much movement from north to south. Now, this is a bit of a long slide. Uh, I just wanted to pause for a second to remind us uh, about the historical context of migration. Uh, that it, migration historically, you know, has been more the rule in human history, not the exception. Uh, 
Uh, it wasn't until the advent of the nation state. So here I'm looking forward to this idea of the migration state and the creation of this Westphalian system of nation states. Uh, I, I would just pause briefly here and give you one little anecdote. You mentioned that Imis, Imis is one of your partners in Osnabrück and uh, Uwe knows that I worked for many years there with Klaus Bada and his colleagues. And once I published a, uh, an article in the Imis by Kada, their, their, their review, and I, I don't remember the name of the uh, editor, the person who was reviewing the article, but he was a very serious demographer, you know, uh, always looking at the numbers. Uh, not really a historian or a political scientist. And I had written in this article something about the, West, the Westphalian uh, system, the Westphalian states. And I remember he wrote in the margins, he said, was ist das? You know, what is this Westphalian thing? And he's sitting in Hasenburg, you know, just next to Munster, where the Westphalian piece was, was included. So I always remember, you know, the irony of having this uh, German editor uh, saying, what, what, what are you talking about? What is this Westphalian thing? But uh, so the, the creation of the system of Westphalian states, uh, of course, resulted in, in, in tremendous amount of conflict and war. The Westphalian peace itself was meant to put an end to the Thirty Years' War, the religious wars in Europe. So as my colleague in Amsterdam, Leiden, Leo uh, Lukasen reminds us, you know, war is a, is a very, very important driver uh, for migration. Uh, and Leo, uh, who has a chapter, by the way, in this new book, Leo also points out that from the 17th to 19th century, uh, much of the migration in the world was unfree. That is to say, it, it was often indentured. And of course we have slavery, uh, but, uh, in spite of this unfree migration, the borders uh, up through the 19th century were still relatively open. It was difficult to move, difficult to travel, but you didn't have this hard system of nation states. Uh, and then you get into the 20th century when, of course, uh, everything blows up. Uh, we have wars and genocide uh, and the closure of the, of the, of the state system, <clears throat> what I call the hardening of the Westphalian system in the interwar period. Uh, but also this brings, of course, an, an end, the beginning of the end of the European system of imperialism and colonialism, uh, you know, which is, which is very much a history, you know, driving migration uh, in, the, in the modern period. Uh, and uh, for the colleague who's working on human rights, uh, I very much stress uh, what I call the humanitarian turn after World War II, again, just to complete this historical uh, uh, context, uh, and we see the advent of these new human rights regimes with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and, of course, the 1951 Geneva Convention on Refugees. So let's talk a little bit more about this idea of a migration state. I want to get into this. This is probably the most important uh, innovation of this, of this work and of this book. Uh, this 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 uh, picture here, uh, again, this is a, a look at what is happening in the post-World War II era. Um, you know, we had what I call from the Second World War uh, from the early 1950s uh, with the creation of the Bretton Woods system, uh, we entered into what I would call a liberal interregnum, uh, which of course was very much tied to the Cold War itself, but the victorious powers made a great effort uh, to avoid going back to the interwar system of beggar thy neighbor policies. Uh, they constructed a, an international regime for trade, uh, which is based on the principle of comparative advantage. Uh, and uh, you can see that the volume of trade uh, explodes during this period. So that is one pillar of globalization. Uh, and of course, you can't trade, you can't buy and sell things without money and without credit. So the, the Bretton Woods planners were very careful to build a system for finance and stable exchange rates uh, and providing uh, sufficient liquidity for the global economy. Uh, and that was done through the IMF um, and with the World Bank also playing a role. So you have these two pillars of globalization that are very much institutionalized. They have been under enormous stress, under enormous pressure now, especially since the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. 
But then when you look at the, the third pillar of globalization, remember that the global economy sits on three, a three-legged stool, uh, migration is the third pillar, which we don't think that much about. We haven't looked at it as much as the others. And even though migration has been going up, even though we see growing migration interdependence, uh, there has, it has not been possible for the international community, uh, the UN system, to come up with a global migration regime. And I, I will come back and talk more about that uh, a bit later in the talk. So now to switch to thinking about this, what I call emerging migration state, uh, and this is for the political theorists and the international relations scholars that are, that are out there listening to this. Um, when you think of the state, go back to that Westphalian moment, the state was itself created as a garrison state, you know, to protect the territory, to protect the population, to protect the, the government uh, of, the, of the state. Um, and it was very much associated with the absolutist period in European political history, 16th, 17th century. Uh, the French uh, Sun King, Louis XIV, being a classic example of a state builder. Uh, and of course, the primary function of the state was security, uh, to protect uh, the territory, to expand the territory through war, uh, and to make sure that the monarch knows who are um, his or her subject. Uh, but by the time we get into the 18th and the 19th century, the modern state changes quite dramatically. It, it gets it's much more involvement in economics. Uh, and we see the emergence of what Richard Grosskrantz called in a little book, the trading state. Uh, and the function of the state now becomes much more of an economic function. Uh, and the actors in the system are not just states anymore. We have increasingly powerful multinational corporations and firms. What I am arguing, and this is the key point in the argument, it's a historical and theoretical argument, that uh, as we move into especially the post-World War II era, we have seen the emergence of the migration state. So the management of migration by states uh, this, uh, for strategic purposes becomes much more important in the post-World War II era. And if the focus, the focus of the trading state is on markets and building markets and taking care of firms, the focus of the migration state is much more on welfare. It's much more about national development, national economic development, and it, it, it resides heavily on rights. You know, rights are the key to, man to migration management. Let me repeat that. Rights are the key to migration management. And the focus here is on the citizens, uh, who are the citizens, who are the members, and who has rights. Um, I'm probably going to skip over some of this, but you know, this is sort of a long laundry list of things. If we want to look at, at or measure a migration state, you can just glance through these. Uh, states have to be open, relatively open. They have to manage migration. Um, and there are gains, of course, strategic gains for the receiving states. They get the manpower and human capital. We know how important immigration is in economic development, economic growth, and, and for uh, dem demographic stability. Canada is a perfect example of a migration state, a highly developed migration state, where migration is very much part of a national development strategy. Um, and, but also there are gains for sending states. Uh, the sending states, of course, are very interested in getting remittances, uh, impossible return migration. So the brain drain turns into a brain gain. Uh, and a good example, a perfect example of a migration state on the sending side would be the Philippines, where migration is a, uh, a central feature of uh, Philippine national uh, development policy. Uh, a migration state is also a state which clearly defines the status of foreigners uh, in terms of rights. Uh, it's a state which has legal, legal provisions for possible settlement, naturalization, citizenship, or return migration. And uh, these are states that have signed up to the Refugee Convention. And that's a sort of an ideal, typical version of what I call a migration state. Uh, obviously, the state has to have institutional capacity, uh, it has to have a way of, of, of managing the quantity and quality of rights uh, and making sure that migration is safe and orderly. 
uh, and that there's a market element in this and uh, states may also, of course, team up with other states uh, to build regional or even international migration regimes. So here is a picture, and I'll pause on this picture for a moment, still talking about the migration state. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture before in my work. It's become very central for the past uh, five, six, seven years. Uh, I first uh, came up with this idea when I was on sabbatical working at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. And when you think about migration governance, it doesn't matter where the state is in the world. There are always basically four dimensions to migration policy. Um, and I would say in a normal time, we're very focused on markets. Markets tend to dominate the discussion about migration. What are the economic benefits of migration? Who is benefiting? Who's winning? Who's losing? You know, those are very normal debates. And in Germany, of course, the debates are intense as they are in the United States uh, uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, if you're looking at it from a sending state point of view, how much are we losing by sending our people abroad to work abroad? And how much are we gaining? So that's one dynamic, one thing when you look at the migration state. Uh, but, and here's where my argument comes in. Uh, you can't manage migration in the long term unless you are attentive to the status and to the rights of migrants. So you immediately, you can ask yourself the question, well, what about Saudi Arabia? You know, what about the United Arab Emirates, you know, where they don't grant any rights really to, to the migrant workers? Just pause and think about that. We'll come back to that question. But these are the normal dimensions of my give and take of migration policy. Every uh, country debates these things. But we know that migration also has a very powerful security dimension. Uh, and we were reminded of this with the 9 11 uh, terrorist attacks that don't forget the number one responsibility of the state is to protect its people, its territory. And if you have an attack that occurs like we saw on 9-11, that is a failure of the state. So you, the state has to be attentive to the security dimension. Uh, of course, we can also see this uh, in the debates in Europe. Uh, but um, again, I, I'll come back and talk more about this. But here, the final thing, of course, is the perfect storm You know, when you talk about migration policy. And that's when culture and identity come into play. So uh, if you think about this problem of migration governance. Um, it is, I would say, it is every politician's worst nightmare because how do you possibly build a coalition? How do you achieve some kind of equilibrium to make a migration policy? I think uh, Professor Dr. Bendel has, uh, uh, has been very involved in German immigration integration policy. So she's seen firsthand, you know, just how complicated this can be from a political standpoint. Um, here is a somewhat fancy slide. If you think, if you think that the game of migration policy is difficult, it's like a four-dimensional game of chess, but you have to play it on three levels because migration is happening. Migration debates are going on uh, at least at three levels. Uh, they obviously, they're happening at the national level. Germany has a migration policy. Uh, they're also happening very intensely at the local level. I don't know how many of you, where you're from uh, in the world or in Germany, but you, you know here in Erlangen, for example, I'm sure there's a lot of discussion and debate about migration, migrants and refugees. Uh, but don't forget, when every time a state makes a policy or changes something with respect to migration, it affects all the other states in the migration system. So it, it, it has an enormous international dimension. Uh, even a hardcore nativist unilateralist like uh, Donald Trump discovered that he couldn't simply stop migration from Mexico and Central America without the cooperation of Mexico. So, uh, so it's always going to have an international dimension. So I think I will very, very quickly skip over some of this because it's mostly just pedagogical. Um, but, you know, when I think about migration, I think about economics, I think about demand pull, I think about supply push, uh, and we know that uh, markets cannot function uh, without the networks that are involved, family ties, the social capital. But what I say is these are the necessary conditions for migration, 
The sufficient conditions are still legal and political, uh, namely rights. Um, and we know that all states have the right to control entry. Uh, uh, they do not have the right under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to control exit. Uh, so it's a pretty hollow right when you have a right to leave a place, but no right to enter somewhere else. So, um, and of course, we, we, we know about the, the Geneva Convention and the 67 protocol uh, for the refugee regime. Uh, this is just a picture to show you some of the levels of economic inequality. You can see the dark blue states, uh, which are the wealthiest states, the ones that are in brown or red, the poorest states, and those sort of in between. Uh, this is, again, just simply a picture to show you where uh, most of the world's migrants are located. Uh, again, one of the stunning things about this, this silly map is to see how many migrants, how many uh, migrants there are in the countries of the Persian Gulf. And, and that's the big green blob in the middle of this graph. So there's clearly a very intense level of migration. And you have a migration system, you know, between Persian Gulf, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, I'll try to talk a bit more about that as I get further into this. Again, just stressing the humanitarian dimension of migration. I think all of you are probably familiar with these numbers. Uh, these are the UNHCR numbers. Uh, if you extend this out to 2022, we're going to have to make a new category for the Ukrainians uh, because we, you know, it's not clear exactly what 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 will be the status of the Ukrainians. But we have another very large. Uh, uh, movement of people here, uh, forced uh, migration uh, and displacement of the Ukrainian population. So you can see how the humanitarian dimension of migration is becoming more and more important. So when I think about this migration state, I have laid this out for you, I think, pretty clearly. Um, we have to think about what goes on in practice. And I want to just stress something that I have written about for 30 some years, like many of you may be familiar with this idea of the liberal paradox. Uh, migration has always been a problem for liberal states and liberal societies because these liberal states are based on a social contract, uh, you know, between the citizenry, the, the demos uh, and the government. And uh, you have to protect the social contract. You have to protect the institutions of citizenship and the sovereignty of the state. Uh, a liberal, liberal state, any state cannot function uh, without being able to control uh, its borders and know who, who are its uh, citizens or subjects, if you will. Uh, so the, but the, so the economic, the, the political logic is more one of closure, whereas the economic logic uh, for the liberal states and liberal economies, we can see is one of openness uh, because migration is uh, very important for economic growth uh, and demographic stability. So this is a paradox. And every state is wrestling with this paradox. How much, how open should we be? How closed should we be? How do you get out of this paradox if you're a politician? The only country in the world that seems completely comfortable right now, or more or less, with this is Canada. Uh, and again, we can talk about why Canada seems to have, at least for the moment anyway, resolved this paradox. Um, and I want to stress that there are, this is our typology of migration states, the varieties of migration states, and you will find uh, chapters about each of these states in the book, Understanding Global Migration. Of course, we still have to look carefully at the liberal settler states, settler societies, uh, what we call in the controlling immigration book, the nation's immigrants. Uh, and I know that in and of itself is a controversial idea uh, because the nations of immigrants were created uh, by uh, imperialism and colonialism, uh, genocide, um, you know, slavery was involved. So, you know, these liberal quote unquote, states also have a very illiberal side to them, but they are, they are the states and societies where migration is part of some of the founding idea, the founding moment. Uh, it's especially true in the United States, uh, but also in Canada, uh, Australia, uh, and other, um, uh, other of these settler societies. Uh, when you look at Europe, on the other hand, we're not talking about nations of immigrants. These are not societies where migration was part of some founding idea or founding myth. Uh, 
most many of the European states, as Klaus Bader would remind us about Germany, Germany was a country that sent people away. So for most of its history, it was a country of immigration with an E. But by the time we get into the post-World War II era, many of these societies which had been sending people away for centuries, like the Netherlands or Belgium or uh, uh, the United Kingdom, for example, uh, not so much the French. The French did have times when their, their citizens migrated abroad. But these are post-imperial systems, post-imperial migration states. So they have to wrestle with the legacy of imperialism and colonialism. Not so much true in Germany, because Germany lost its colonies after the First World War. But uh, think of the debates that are going on in France, or Belgium, or the Netherlands, or the United Kingdom, or uh, Spain, or Portugal. You know, all of these are states that were once great uh, imperial powers. So they have to manage migration in terms of the imperial uh, legacies that are involved with migration. Uh, but if you flip this around and look at states like India, for example, or South Africa, I mean, these are states that are post-colonial migration states. You know, they were once colonies and now they are independent states and they have to manage migration uh, uh, using some kind of post-colonial framework. So there's, there are chapters in this book on uh, countries like India, uh, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, South Africa, and, and so forth. Uh, and um, we also added another type, another type of migration state, which was insisted upon by my colleagues who work on Asia, especially East Asia. Uh, these are developmental migration states where migration has become part of a developmental uh, strategy. Uh, uh, Japan and Korea would be two examples of this. So what are the characteristics of these different migration states? Some are liberal, some are illiberal. And how does migration govern, governance differ in each of these uh, different uh, types of migration states? What are the trade-offs that are made between rights and markets? Um, again, I'm not going to spend much time on the numbers. I think uh, most of you are familiar with the numbers. Uh, this is just looking at the share of the foreign-born population in the total population of OECD countries. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see the OECD average near the bottom there uh, and the countries that have experienced the highest levels of migration, countries like Israel, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Switzerland, and so forth. Uh, so those are just, again, empirical. If you want to look, where are the migrants? Where are they going? These are states that are intensely migration states. Um, uh, and looking at permanent migrants to the OECD countries, this is a, a rolling average of a percentage of the total population from 2010 to 2018. Again, Luxembourg is off the charts, not surprisingly. Iceland, uh, the small states like Switzerland, Sweden, of course, very high, the Scandinavian countries, and so forth. So this just shows you some states where migration, again, is playing a very, very large role in national development. Uh, this is a way of breaking down the permanent flows. It may be a little bit hard to see. If you look at flows among the OECD countries, this is data from 2018. And uh, the most important thing is to look at the, at the, um, um, at the graphs and at the, uh, the, can't think either in French or in English now, um, uh, what, what the, uh, the darker lines stand for humanitarian migration. Uh, it's important to look at the gray lines on the far right, which are free movers you know, within the EU and so forth and so on, family immigration. Uh, actually, it's much easier to see this in this color-coded chart here. Again, looking at migration states, you can see the US, so important, but, but look at how important family migration is. Uh, there's always a huge debate in the United States about why are we taking so many family migrants? Economists don't like that. They think we should be focused much more on human capital. Um, uh, let's see where Germany, uh, of course, is one of the largest migration states uh, in Europe. And uh, Germany is not taking so many families, but taking many uh, uh, humanitarian migrants and so forth, uh, and a lot of free movers. So, you know, this just sh shows you how migration is evolving 
uh, in these major migration states. Uh, I think I will skip over that. Uh, this is, I don't know how many of you in here are familiar with MITEX, uh, which is an index that tries to measure rights for migrants. So when I, when I mentioned rights earlier, this is a way to try to operationalize and think about rights. So you can see the countries that are the most expansive. These are, these are 2020 uh, data. Uh, uh, and so it's a bit surprising. Sweden, Finland, Portugal, Canada, New Zealand, the US is up there fairly high. Germany, for some reason, is in the middle. I don't, I'm not sure why Germany is a country that shows up more in the middle of this uh, graph. Um, uh, Mexico, I know some of you in here are interested in Mexico, not so great. Uh, the EU 28, these are just some MIPEX scores. So if any of you have any ideas about you know, how to interpret these scores, we can come back to that in the discussion. Uh, this is just a picture to drive home my point about markets and the importance of the market dynamic. Have you ever seen this picture before? Uh, my German is awful, but even I know what uh, if you're 16 mark, I'm an Italian, so you, for 60 marks, you can buy yourself an Italian. These are young, young uh, Italian workers in the Munich train station in 1960. So you can see how important the market dynamic was uh, in the early stages of, of post-war European migration. These, of course, are people picking uh, uh, crops in the fields in California. Uh, many of these people are undocumented uh, migrants. Uh, they're not authorized migrants. Uh, what about their rights? I mean, shouldn't they be given some right to, to live and settle in the United States? So this is a huge debate that's going on now in the US. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen this famous photograph here, which again just drives home the point about a uh, about the humanitarian dimension and the importance of rights. Uh, I think Uwe Hunger will remember that he Uwe, I think took he took this picture. Uh, I think this is in Bochum, I believe, and uh, it's just in the, in the time of the 2015 2016 crisis. Uh, and of course, I don't have to interpret the German for you here, but. Uh, again, just a reminder in Germany of the importance of German history with respect to migration and refugees, and that you know Germany is committed to a humanitarian and a rights-based regime. So I, I couldn't resist uh, you know getting my picture made in front of this very very uh, telling port uh, portrait. Uh, and of course, we know about the security dimension of migration, the security concerns, and the cultural backlash. Uh, the attacks that occurred uh, in the 20, uh, 2000s and 2010s in particular. Uh, I normally live in Paris when I'm there, very often there. Uh, I live very close to the Bataclan, Bataclan Theater where uh, over 100 people were, were murdered uh, one nice, beautiful Saturday evening in Paris. So, you know, this raised again the security and the cultural dimension. Um, and uh, I think most of you are familiar with the refusal of many of the East European countries to uh, accept the migrants during the Syrian uh, migration uh, movement uh, in 2015, 2016. Uh, 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 I always like to quote Viktor Victor Orban, the Hungarian minister who said that Merkel was guilty of moral imperialism by trying to force Hungary and other states to except migrants. And, and a lot of the arguments among the East Europeans, the so-called Visegrad group, their arguments were, look, we were not, not imperial powers. We had no colonial history. You know, why should we be responsible for taking in these refugees? And by the way, we're a overwhelmingly white Christian society. Uh, so we don't want this kind of diversity. We have no responsibility in this regard. But contrast this with the reaction to the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, situation today where uh, the Europeans, especially the East Europeans, were very quick to open uh, their borders to Ukrainians. So again, you can see the cultural dimension with the Ukrainian uh, exodus, uh, how important it is. You've got a neighbor, uh, uh, a very close neighbor, uh, culturally compatible uh, society. Uh, and of course, don't forget with the Ukrainians, you have an enormous security uh, issue here. I mean, for the, with the Syrians in the Middle East, you know, as difficult as it is, it's still far away. You know, Europe has not got great security 
there's not a, a, a security dynamic so much at work when you had the Syrians and others coming. But in uh, this crisis, uh, uh, Europeans, EU, NATO are in a direct confrontation with Russia. So, you know, there's a tremendous security uh, dynamic involved. Um, okay, so these are just more pictures to drive home the point about the, uh, the cultural dimension. I always like this picture of a young French girl, you know, saying, what about me? Don't I have a right to be different? Uh, what, what happened to fraternité? We know about liberté, égalité. Um, here's a picture of the old man. I think they kept him locked in the closet for the last election so that he wouldn't uh, spoil it for his daughter, but she fell short in her bid uh, to become president of France. But uh, I've watched over many decades the development of the French far right. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen, how many of you have seen this? This was an official uh, publicity campaign that was launched by the French government uh, about a year ago uh, when I first arrived in Paris. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the French debates, but the whole idea here was France can deal with diversity. Uh, it can deal with immigration because it is a light country, meaning a secular country. Uh, and uh, some have looked at these uh, uh, at these posters and said they look very racist because obviously you're identifying people largely by the color of their skin and also by their names. Uh, but this was intended by the French government to appeal <coughs> not just to the right, the far right, but also to appeal to the left because it brought into play what I call these Republican ideas uh, about uh, France being a, a, a country where which is able to assimilate uh, 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 different cultures and different peoples. Uh, and the campaign itself was referred to as <coughs> c'est ça la laïcité. You know, this is what la laïcité allows France to do, to manage migration. So uh, again, I don't have to stress a, a, a picture like this. I do remember being at a meeting in Osnabrück many years ago uh, in a meeting with Bada and his colleagues we were having, I don't know if you were there, but um, we came out to go to lunch in Austin Book, and there were a group of uh, these young men in uh, uh, cars and motorcycles, and they were yelling, screaming at us on the street, you know, Auslanderhaus. I don't know if they knew that we were migration scholars, but uh, so this is a dynamic that you're very familiar with in the German case. Um, and of course, don't forget Brexit. This is our friend uh, Nigel Farage. Uh, and of course, Mr. Farage, you can see with the French name, he was from a French Huguenot family. And I, I do think Erlangen has a Huguenot uh, uh, history, as I recall. Uh, uh, one of my uh, old colleagues in France early on was famous French economist and demographer, uh, Alfred Sauvy. Uh, and Mr. Sauvy always used to tell me the greatest crime in French history was the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the expulsion of the Huguenots because the French chase away, you know, the most talented, uh, educated people in their society by, by forcing the Protestants to leave. And ironically, Mr. Farage is himself a descendant of those French Huguenots. And I think he has a German wife, if I'm not mistaken. He has a German wife, I'm pretty sure. But he was the leader of the Brexit, the Brexit party and the Brexit movement. This, of course, is our own uh, um, former president uh, who was uh, very much uh, in the tradition of the old American nativism, uh, wanting to uh, expel migrants. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his, uh, his nativist and racist uh, statements, uh, which go back many years. Um, so I think I will skip over some of this in the interest of time. I don't have time really to get into the economics, although we do have to be aware of the fact, these are American data, so I need to stop a minute, that um, immigration plays an incredibly important role in labor force growth in the United States in particular. Um, you know, without migration, the, the workforce will be shrinking very uh, dramatically. Um, you can see, this is just a vivid picture again of the economic dimensions of migration. Um, uh, what will be the US population in 2035? Um, US born with immigrant parents will make, an, make up an increasingly large uh, percentage of the American population. 
um, and um, first generation immigrants will continue to play a role. Uh, but if you look at this graph, which is put together by the Pew, uh, by the Pew Research Center, uh, this has now been twisted into a sort of right wing ideology about the idea of a great replacement. Uh, that the migrants are being brought in to, uh, to replace the native, the native population. This was an idea that was put forward by a French uh, writer named uh, René Camus. Um, so I'm going to have to probably end just by saying a few things about migration interdependence. Uh, I may skip to the very end and say a few words about the global governance uh, problems, but migration interdependence um, how do you measure it? What do we mean by it? Uh, if you want to just make a few notes about this, we can come back to it in the discussion. But when you think about the migration of your dependence, we're talking about a mutual dependence of population in a migration system that leads to greater economic and socio-political integration. Um, last year, I worked on a paper on migration and welfare with a, with a Swedish colleague and um, I remember looking at the numbers, the largest foreign population in Europe, uh, foreign-born population last year, which country had the largest foreign-born population? Uh, it was actually Poland. And who were these foreign-born people in Poland? They are Ukrainians, 500, 600,000 Ukrainians. So, and that was, well before the, the conflict. So just think, think for a minute about the migration interdependence between Poland and Ukraine uh, and how important this is for the current uh, conflict. Uh, but we know that migration can change uh, comparative advantage. For those of you who have studied international economics, it can alter factor prices and intensities, uh, you know, uh, under the hexa uh arguments, the hexa theorem. Uh, but migration interdependence is not just about economics. It's also about social and political remittances. Uh, we can look at the work of uh, somebody like Peggy Levitt, for example. And in, of course, migration interdependence can lead to the creation of the diaspora. So if you think about the Ukrainian crisis, where are the Ukrainians going? They're going where their families are, where they have relatives. Uh, so the, the interdependence here, again, is very important. And migration, of course, is a force driving dependence. This is a picture of the importance of remittances, uh, which are the largest source of foreign exchange in most uh, developing countries, much bigger than foreign direct investment, much bigger than official development assistance. This comes from World Bank data. Uh, and just a few quick glances at this uh, way of looking at migration interdependence. Um, if you look at remittances as a percentage of GDP on um, uh, one axis and the migrant stock or percent of the population on the other, you get a pretty neat, what I call an L curve and countries fall into three categories. They're either receiving countries, sending countries, or somehow they are countries that are moving or in transition. And you can just see where, where these countries are. Uh, this is in 2010. Uh, in 2015, the picture has not changed very much. That's the most recent data uh, that I have. Again, I'm sorry to go quickly here, but I want to finish up and leave some time. These are countries with very high variability on the L curve. Uh, obviously, countries like Lebanon and Jordan, uh, you know, which are receiving large numbers of refugees. Uh, countries like Qatar and Kuwait, uh, which have such high levels of foreign Workers. So this is a way simply <coughs> of trying to <coughs> think about and measure migration interdependence. What I did here was just simply look at how countries are evolving uh, on this uh, L curve. This is changes in remittances as a percentage of GDP and changes in migrant stock. Uh, so you can see Turkey, for example, is moving very rapidly here, not surprisingly, because Turkey has been receiving a lot of refugees, uh, Mexico, Morocco, uh, these are countries that are moving fast, even the Korean Republic. Uh, <coughs> and here we can see less dispersion, more change, and outlier <coughs> for 2015, much of this driven by refugee migration. I'm sorry to go fast with this, but I want to conclude very quickly. <coughs> 
So uh, just a few final points by way of conclusion. Uh, when you think about interdependence or the theory of complex interdependence, I often send my students back to read Immanuel Kant's essay on perpetual peace because the theory of interdependence is there uh, in his essay on perpetual peace, in, which was originally published in 1795. And uh, in, this, uh, in this essay, you know, Kant argues that open societies and economies uh, can lead to a more peaceful and democratic world. So this has been a, a part of liberal thinking, you know, going back uh, even to the, to, the, to the 18th century. Uh, and this complex independence is supposed to, it predicts that trade and investment will lead to a diffusion of hard power uh, and, uh, the, and, and, and it naturally entails the creation of international regimes and institutions that help to keep countries open uh, in the face of forces that push them towards being more protectionist. Um, and this involves cooperation uh, in the management of the flows of goods, capital, people, and services, uh, and the pursuit of either international and global public goods or, uh, or, or perhaps club goods. Uh, I don't need to explain this to Europeans. I mean, this is sort of the essence in a way of, of the European Union. Uh, but when you put all this together, you basically have uh, the, the idea of liberal institutionalism uh, and uh, the close association between interdependence, cooperation, and global governance. So uh, a key challenge, I think, this is my sort of my challenge to all of you as students and scholars, is how do we measure and refine this measure of inter migration interdependence? We need to model it. We need to understand how it affects the distribution and the balance of power within the international system. So I'm going to skip over all of this and go to a final slide here. Um, uh, again, I don't have time to go through this, but uh, you know, when you look at migration governance, uh, it's, it's incredibly important to have regional migration systems uh, that uh, find a way to make migration more legal and more orderly. Uh, I would argue that this should take the form of a public good. I don't have time to, to get into this, uh, but I will stop with this final slide, especially a colleague who works on human rights will probably find this of interest. But if you look at institutions that have been set up to, to govern uh, the international uh, migration system, uh, they are much weaker and much less institutionalized than uh, the institutions for trade and finance. Finance is by far the hardest of these regimes. Uh, we have one fairly strong multilateral regime for migration, and that's the refugee regime. But when you look at labor, <coughs> whether on the high end or the low end, <coughs> the international uh, migration regimes are actually quite weak. That is to say, multilateralism is weak and the institutions are weak. So on that, I probably better stop. That's more than enough on a beautiful, you know, sunny Mediterranean day here in Erlangen. So I hope this is some food for thought and we'll now open it up for discussion. Thank you.